Let's talk about NXT. It's time to discuss NXT from October the 15th, 2024. Good show. It felt like they had to shove too much into it, but still a relatively good show. I I enjoyed it, I must say. So we start the show with a Tony D'Angelo celebration. Him talking about his win over Obafemi. Before Obafemi comes out there, congratulate him on winning the match. Said it'll never happen again. And then that there will be a rematch at Halloween Havoc. He spun the wheel and the match will be tables, ladders, and scares. Which they tell me means no holes barred. Um, I would not just say no holes barred. Anyway, uh, Luca Crucifino is going to end up having a match with Obafemi next week. So uh, they're just doing rematches at Halloween Havoc. Which... Uh, doesn't necessarily, especially since these matches, some of them, especially when you look at the main event, have happened recently. I don't think exactly it's going to drive ticket sales, but what do I know? Oral Mensa is up next. Um, he is seeing through Lexus King's gimmick. Lexus King ultimately is his father's son. He's going he's gonna to cut corners eventually. Alexis King says that cheating is what his father would have done and that he wants to be a different man, so he's not going to cheat. And the two of them have a gentleman's duel, uh, which was the second match on the show. Alexis King defeats Oro Mensa. I got to tell you, the match was better than it should have been. It gave it a lot of time. Uh, so you got to see what Alexis King can do. Uh, problem is, you kind of got to see Alexis King He's not bad, but he's clearly not great. And I think I think he's in his 30s at this point. Uh, he was thinking through some of his spots. He slipped a couple of times on the ropes and different things like this. Oro Mensa is just like a fourth version of like Javon Evans and Wesley and all of these guys who are just thin and athletic. So... I'm not sure why people are not really behind him other than he ain't getting the push. But this match was solid. It was solid enough. But Lexus King is clearly not a ring general. He's more of a character guy. And he's really doing a good job with, with his character. Later, he was talking about winning and said he might be ready for that rounds match to Charlie Dempsey, which Charlie Dempsey disagreed. And then uh, that was about it. He actually gave a little bit of a, a thumbs up to Tony D'Angelo as well. So they're teasing that Lexus King, after winning this match, it might be moving on to championship matches, which could be fun because he's been around for a while. And I'm surprised they haven't had him wrestle for more titles. So he needs to be moving forward too anyway because he's just kind of been doing random directionless feuds for a while now. Show some love to Oro Mensa, somebody. Somebody sort of got some love. Anyway... Uh, next, Steph Stephanie Vecker defeats Ren Sinclair with a package backbreaker. It seemed like her finisher is really a package power driver, but because WWE banned power drivers, it's going to the package backbreaker. Uh, ultimately, uh, the match was solid enough. Uh, Stephanie looked good. Um, she's working on the American style. Ren Sinclair hasn't been around. But she's been on the indies quite a, for quite a while. So she's kind of got that look and style to her. She's just kind of bland. She has somewhat of a personality, but they haven't really leaned into it. So Stephanie winning was like an obvious one. This might be a match that is better received on a second watch. But I just kind of was tuned out, with, especially with how long it took. I would have liked for Stephanie to get a more dominant win, but... It was solid enough. Uh, Cora Jade and Roxanne Perez jumped Stephanie Vacker after the match. Julia ended up making the save. Then Stephanie Vacker made the tag team match challenge for Halloween Havoc. Uh, later, uh, these two would have words with Fatal Influence. So because Ava was giving Stephanie Vacker and Julia what they want, Fatal Influence had an attitude and thought that Ava was playing favorites. 
and that they want to fight Kalani Jordan for the North American title. So Ava says, well, if you guys want that, you got to beat Stephanie Vacker and Julia. So Fatal Influence, two members of the team, will agree to fight Stephanie Vacker and Julia next week. Uh, it's a solid enough match, I mean, you know, a warm-up so that Julia and Stephanie Vacker can not only get on TV and get used to, you know, the style and everything, but it also gives us a little bit of a preview of how they how good they're going to work together in this uh they're calling it a dream tag team match. Even though I don't none of my dreams involve women wrestling. <laughs> I can tell you that, especially not Cora damn Jade. None of my dreams of Arwen Cora Jade is going to feature her wrestling. I'm just just no. Not at all. Uh Next, you had Brinley Reese and Carmen Petrovich. They got an apology from Ashanti Theodonis. He will apologize for costing them that tag team match. This was about a month ago, I think. It was a while back. Anyway, Sean Spears came up. He was simping, saying that uh, Ashanti Theodonis is not respecting the women. You need to respect the women. This useless bum crashes this party. And then started saying, you need to respect the women. Ain't that right, Brooks? And then Brooks was like, yeah. And then Brooks and Ashanti Theodonis had words. And then it's when we realized that Ashanti Theodonis is tiny and Brooks Jensen is huge. He is big. I didn't think he was that big. Um, <clears throat> anyway, uh, Brooks Jensen snatched the rose that he had given to, I think, Carmen Petrovich and he ripped the bud off the rose and Kind of sprinkled the petals all over the floor. So after Ashanti and Brooks Jensen got into an argument, Carmen Petrovich actually bent down and collected all the rose petals. This will become important later, as when they had the match, she came out ringside and poured the rose petals onto the ring. This distracted Ashanti Diodonis because he's not sure what she means by this. I'm also not sure what she means by this. But it was one of the many distractions to help Brooks Jensen win. The other distraction was that bum-ass Sean Spears who distracted the referee. It was awful. Sean Spears was involved. This was this felt like they didn't give it enough time to really develop. But at the same time, since it involved Sean Spears, I'm not upset that it didn't get a lot of TV time. Anyway, they're doing a story where Carmen Petrovich is sending mixed signals to Shani Diodonis where she seems like she likes him. But it also came across kind of heelish how she distracted him on purpose and then didn't try to help him when he, when he was getting jumped. So, I don't know. It would be something interesting for her. She needs to do something. But her being the love interest of, of Shani Diodonis could be an interesting storyline so let's see how that for how far that goes Brindley Reese is already tied to a couple of black guys so does she really need to be tied to another one I don't know Cedric Alexander gave Javon Evans props on his match with Randy Orton I will also do that even though I'm still not a huge fan of the match between Randy Orton and Javon Evans I did watch it again over the weekend and I did walk away with it with thinking that it was better on the second watch than I did on the first Clearly, the botches are still there, but I think the story they were telling was far more interesting the second time than I did the first time. The first time, it was all about the spot, you know, what's going to happen when it comes to the spot that then <laughs> Javon Evans blew the spot. So, But here, we get a situation in which... Uh, everybody is giving Javon Evans credit for his match with Randy Orton. And then Wesley shows up, says, stay out of my way. Enjoy your 15 minutes of fame, but you're not ready for the main event. So then Javon Evans and Wesley start to argue. And I was like, oh, this is interesting. Um, and in the mat, then we go to the match. And this is visually the pin. Now, the match itself, the main event, the triple threat match, Ethan Page, Javon Evans, Wesley was tremendous. It was a great main event. Javon Evans had the building shaking literally. 
They were that excited at the idea of this kid winning. I don't know why he's so over, but he's really over with this crowd. And they really behind him, and they really want to see him win. Um, unfortunately, he doesn't have much of a personality, and Trick Williams is a babyface, so he's not really going to get the shot against Trick Williams, but what a phenomenal match this was. Uh, but like I was saying pr prior, Javon Evans actually had a visual pin on Wesley with his uh, double jump tornado, uh, and Ethan Page rolled him up and pinned him. So Javon Evans lost, but he lost because he was winning and let his guard down. So Ethan Page steals the victory. He then calls out Trick Williams and demands that they spin the wheel and we end up getting a Devil's Playground match that will take place between these two at Halloween Havoc. And I am not enthused. I'm not enthused. Uh, I would have preferred for Wesley to win. I think it's time for him to move up in the roster. And I, again, if you've been listening to my channel for a while, you know I'm not a huge fan of Wesley. So if I want Wesley to move up, I'm completely and totally over Ethan Page. I don't need, I don't need, they don't need a third match. Like this isn't some great trilogy. Sometimes you don't need a third match. Or if you're going to do a third match, you should have did it here or they should have done it next week or something like, I think the pay-per-view next week or the week after next or something. In any event, doesn't matter. The idea that we need to have Trick Williams versus Ethan Page 3, I don't think so. I don't think we needed that. Now, clearly they're going towards Wesley and Javon Evans as the feud. As, you know, one of uh, Wesley's uh, attacks on Javon Evans verbally was that Javon Evans does not have the potential to be as successful as he is in uh, NXT. While Javon Evans was talking about how kind of Wesley was kind of washed. So this is going to be an interesting feud and they're going to have good matches together, but they're going to be traditionally fast paced athletic matches. And since Wesley's a little bit better on the microphone than he was before and he, but he still is not a lot in terms of charisma and personality. Well, Javon Evans has charisma, but he can't talk for shit. And he's very athletic, but he's also very green as well. I mean, he's just a kid. So his push is moving kind of fast. And they're slowing it down, which is good. But he's still higher on the card than he probably should be. Um, I'm talking about Javon Evans at this point. Now, it's fine that they're teasing him in the main spot. But he certainly shouldn't be there. It's just not time yet. Uh, but Wesley having to be the guy that's going to have to work with them, that, that works for me. You know, it's fine. Now, Halloween Havoc, I'm definitely concerned. Again, what I said earlier is that they're doing basically just rematches. And um, I know that they did a bunch of stuff for the CW launch show and the first two shows anyway. And they're still booking very well, but what they've done is essentially left Halloween Havoc kind of hollow, where now we got, we just saw this match on TV two weeks ago, and now it's the main event of Halloween Havoc. And we just had a women's championship match two weeks ago, so we don't get one of those at Halloween Havoc. And it doesn't matter anyway, because Julia's already lost, and Stephanie just got there and only wrestled one match since then, so... You know, are either one of them really contenders for the belt? No, not yet. So, and I guess you got to do this thing with Cora Jade. So the rest of the card is really going to have to do some heavy lifting when it comes to selling tickets for Halloween Havoc because I just don't see it. Uh, it's unfortunate. Uh, Jakara Jackson and Lash Legend did exactly what I thought they were going to do. They bragged about cost and damage control of the match. So damage control is going to fight them next week, which... I think everybody called it. EO and Kyrie and NXT are always fun. And Lash Legend and Jakara Jackson getting the rub is, is good. I don't I don't mind that. I actually don't hate it. Especially since they're apparently they're trying to do something with them now. So that's a good thing. So we got a vignette for Nikita Lyons because she's been gone for a year. 
basically saying that NXT has only seen a sliver of what she can do, and she's a multi-dimensional superstar who can sing, dance, do martial arts, etc. And that her bounce back is always greater than her setback, and she's ready to take over. So this brings us to the match I paid the, the most attention to. I scrutinized this match very closely. Lola Vice versus Nikita Lyons. Uh, this they did Power Rangers fight stuff at the beginning, which dodging strikes and dodging spin kicks, and I was like, "This looks incredibly choreographed. I don't like it." Um, once it settled down, it got okay. Now they were still throwing strikes. Nikita is much bigger than Lola Vice, and I think she needs to work like a bigger girl. And what I mean by that is she needs to register without taking a bump. She needs to look at Nia Jax. Matter of fact, don't do that. Don't look at Nia Jax and do what she do. Uh, study like some classic big man wrestlers, especially when they get like kicked in the thigh or something. Like a Kevin Nash, like how he would immediately go for the ropes or something like that. You know, because um, almost all of her opponents are going to be smaller than her. I'm talking about Nikita now, you know. But... Uh, when they were throwing like body strikes and stuff like that, it was okay. You know, clearly they were pulling the punches and it was looking a little choreographed, but it was solid enough. Now, if you thought that this match didn't have enough ass, Jada Parker ran down to the ring to distract Lola Vice. And then when the referee's back was turned, she attacked Lola Vice with her finisher, which is the running hip attack, what they call hypnotic. And they threw her back in the ring, and the Keto Lions hit a Vader bomb to win the match. A much better finish than the jump and split move that she was doing. It fits. She's a bigger girl. She's bigger than most people. So her body weight coming down on top of you is impressive. And it's absolutely enough to get a win. So the Keto Lions wins with the Vader bomb. And Lola Vice didn't really sell the loss because we're doing storytelling stuff. So she basically just mugged at the camera, upset that Jada Parker cost her this match. Jada Parker went backstage. She was bragging about, you know, how Lola Vice got hands, but she got hands too. But she had interrupted a Tatum Paxley promo, which was very cringe. And I'm glad she, <laughs> she interrupted it, if we're being honest. So Tatum Paxley said, oh, you might be playing with Lola Vice, you know, but you interrupted my time. And Jada Parker was like, baby, baby, I don't play at all. And I was like, oh, <clears throat> okay. Okay. So Tatum Paxley is still, uh, she's got something going on with Wendy Chu. That's, that's a Wendy Chu Tatum Paxley thing. There's a dollhouse. There's toys. Have at it. Do what you want. This Lola Vice versus Jada Parker thing, I like it. She's now hanging out with her boys again. It was a while since she hung out with the boys. They actually hadn't seen them in a while. So they're back. And she's a heel again, which is what fits her. But it also fits Lola Vice. Lola Vice should be a heel. She's done nothing but lose since she's turned babyface. And I'm, I'm not liking it. I like Lola Vice. I think Lola Vice should be winning matches. I don't know if her just going out there losing all the time is good. I think she's actually growing up as a performer. She is kind of one note, whereas she's just kind of really, you know, sweet Latina, hot Latina. And everybody that she's been feuding with has a little bit more dynamic in terms of character. But when she was a heel, she had depth of character too, because she could, you know, the part of the reason why she got over is the whole thing where she could shake her ass and fight. You know, when she ended up with the big brawl with Shayna Baszler and all that kind of stuff. So, I don't understand why they decided to do this with Lola Vice, where now she's a jobber to the stars, essentially. I'm not a huge fan of that. But, everybody can't win all the time. So, <laughs> I don't know what more to say. Um, Nikita Lyons, I'm not sure where she's going. Uh, she just got back. She didn't get hurt in her first match back, which, you know, was great. But is she going to be pushed for a top spot? Is she going to end up being like Lash Legend and the rest of them where she's just kind of sitting around waiting for a spot to open? Or do they have a plan for her? 
Um, to me, it seemed like you're probably better off turning the Nikita Lions heel, even though it seemed like the crowd likes Nikita. At least it seemed like it, but it also could have been split. I mean, there's just no telling. I wasn't paying attention to the crowd, okay? I was paying attention to what was going on in the ring. You know, this was this when you care about them as performers, very thick performers. And they're very um, uh, thorough in their performances. Okay, let's move on. Riley Osborne is defeated by Ridge Holland. This was one of the things where I felt like, okay, they're doing too much. We didn't really need this. Um, but it was just a catalyst for the return of Andre Chase, who chased off Ridge Holland. And that was pretty much it there. But um, it was six matches on this show. That's fine. But, you know, Riley Osborne and Ridge Holland, Ashanti D. Adonis and Brooks Jensen, that felt like stuff that you would do on Level Up, you know. And these stories aren't really going much of anywhere. At least Lola Vice is a regular on this show. So her and Jada Parker, they're getting a lot of TV time. They're doing stuff there. But of the good stuff on the show, the main event was great. Uh, I thought the main event was fantastic. Did a really good job of making me believe that Javon Evans had a chance of winning. They did it. They told that story wonderfully. And then they had it snatched away from him at the, la at the last minute. I know that eventually you got to give it to him. Like you can't keep teasing that this guy's going to break through and then he never breaks through. So eventually you're going to have to do it, but he's young enough that you can get away with this for a while. And it's not like it's going to break him forever. Um, Oral Mensa and Lexus King, I'll give it a pass in terms of match quality. Now, the, the rules were completely goofy, and I didn't even bother to write the rules down, nor do I care about what the rules are. And the rules didn't really play that much into it, even though I think one of the rules was that you can't throw your opponent over the top rope, which is goofy. Like, I don't understand, the, I don't understand these dumbass rules. Anyway, they did a basic wrestling match that it, it had hold, counter holds, some Lucha stuff, you know, Lexus King was a little slow, but for the most part, it was fine. Uh, Lola Vice and Nikita Lyons wasn't perfect, but I give it a pass. You know, girls just fine. You just can't say you don't like it and you don't want to see it. Um, the filler stuff, uh, the Riley Osborne, Ridge Holland, Ashanti D. Adonis, Bruce Jensen, they further stories that I'm um that are interesting to the fans, like you know, Andre Chase returning is very interesting to that audience. I was like, okay, but this just means that I have to watch Andre Chase versus Ridge Holland. Um Ashanti D. Adonis and Brooks Jensen, I'm not interested in Sean Spears at all. At all. Anywhere near my NXT. Now, the Carmen Petrovich thing, if it's going to, you know, take her character to the next level, I'm interested in seeing where that goes. But I'm not in no way interested in Brooks Jensen. I don't care about Brooks Jensen at all. Um, I'm not thrilled about the idea that the top matches of Halloween Havoc is a women's tag team match and then two men's rematches. I'm not thrilled about that idea. Um, I got to get used to it, of course, but I'm, I'm not thrilled about it. Um, Stephanie Vacker's debut was fine. It didn't blow my mind. It, I don't think it really took the breath out of anyone. So she's definitely going to have to put in some more effort. Um, there was no really great promo segments. You know, uh, Tony D'Angelo's celebration was abbreviated. And so it was Obafemi's appearance on the show. So overall, I think they had a good show. What, the, what, what they had, but they probably tried to do a little much. Let me know what you guys think. And I'll talk to you guys later. Old non-aggression Once that lesson sets in You'll see a session But you got an affection For no progression Regression 